A Boeing 737-800 from Air India Express is lining up for takeoff from Route 27 in Trichy, India, for a flight over towards Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. As the aircraft is accelerating for takeoff, suddenly the backrest of the captain's chair collapses backward. What happens after this is one of the strangest accidents that I have read about recently. Stay tuned. A huge thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. The story actually starts on the 11th of October 2018 and it starts in Dubai where the crew consisting of two pilots and four cabin crew started their flight. They're supposed to fly two sectors over to Trichy in India and then back again to Dubai. The captain of the flight is a 32 year old male. He has got uh, 4,295 hours of total experience and 4,045 hours on the 737. His command experience was only about 542 hours, which makes him a fairly new captain. The first officer was a 51 year old male with 4,202 hours of total time and 3,884 of those hours being on the 737. The first flight of the day was completely uneventful. The first officer was pilot flying for that flight. They flew over from Dubai to Trichy, taxied in, and at time 23.37 they pulled up on stand. They did the pre-flight walk around for the following flight, and during the walk around, which was made by an engineer in Trichy, uh, he recognized that one of the tires on the right hand main landing gear was worn to limits. So they, uh, they replaced that tire and they refueled the aircraft and prepared for the return flight towards Dubai. The weather in Trichy was really good. Only a few clouds around, a temperature of about 27 degrees Celsius and calm winds, which meant that the crew had a choice of which runway they were going to use. The captain was going to be pilot flying for the return flight and he decided that because runway 27 had a shorter departure route, they would go for runway 27. The crew did all of the pre-flight setup according to company procedures and when they did the performance, they did the performance for a flap 5 takeoff. We normally take flaps 5 rather than flaps 1 if we can because it gives us a better tail margin for rotation. The speeds for departure was 143 for V1, 144 for the rotation speed and 151 for V2. And these are pretty normal speeds for a fairly heavily loaded 737-800. At around 40 minutes past midnight local time, the crew was ready to depart and they started taxiing out, backtracking to line up for runway 27. Up until this point, everything was completely normal and at time 0049, the uh, crew got, received their takeoff clearance and they started their takeoff procedure. And the way that this is done in the 737-800 is that the pilot flying advances the thrust levels up to initially 40%. The reason you do this is because you need the engines to start accelerating up to that value more or less in order to make sure that during the later state of the engine acceleration, they will accelerate at the same pace. Pilot monitoring in this case, which was the first officer called stabilized, and then the captain pressed the toga button and said set takeoff thrust. Now in this case, the outer throttle then engaged and started setting the thrust to the predetermined value, which in this case was about 98%. Now, the way that the outer throttle works during the takeoff roll is really important to understand. Initially, and up to about 84 knots, the outer throttle will be set in N1 mode. So that means that it drives the thrust levels up to the predetermined value. But at 84 knots, which is pretty much where the uh, speeds change from the low speed regime to the high speed regime of the takeoff, it goes into something called throttle hold. Okay? This means that the thrust is set where the thrust levels are at that speed and it can be manually changed by the pilot. Now you might ask yourself, why would the outer throttle do that? And the quick answer to that is because if there is a rejected takeoff after that point, you don't want the thrust levels to inadvertently start moving up again. So it's kind of a, a protection mode. Another thing that's really important to understand about the way that we do the takeoffs is that the captain is the one who always takes the decision about the rejected takeoff. And because of that, the captain remains with one hand on the thrust levers until we pass the V1 speed, after which there is no decision to reject anymore. So the captain, who was pilot flying in this case, would have sat with one hand on his yoke and another hand firmly on the thrust levers. 
The takeoff run initially was completely normal. They passed 80 knots, checked, they then continued to accelerate, and at 117 knots, now this is very high speed, the backrest on the captain's chair suddenly collapsed backwards. And what do you do if you suddenly fall backwards? But you grab for something to hold on to, don't you? And this is exactly what happened in this case as well. When we look at the flight data recorder readings, it shows that there was a momentarily pitch up command from the captain's side. But also, crucially for this story, the thrust that was set at 98% with throttle hold on the outer thrust was moved back to 77%. Now, as the captain collapsed backward, he handed over the controls to the first officer. So he said, your controls. And the first officer, who was now dealing with something that he definitely didn't expect, did not verify the, uh, the position of the trust levers. And this is actually, even though it's a lot to ask in a situation like this, it is mandatory in case of an incapacitation, which is actually what we're talking about here. The first thing that you have to do is verify the position of all switches and levers. In this case, that should have led to the first officer verifying where the thrust was, reset the thrust, but this wasn't done. Probably just because of how quickly this happened. So the first officer continued to maintain the aircraft down the center line. Now the thrust is set to 77% instead of 98, which is a considerable reduction. The captain takes about five seconds to kind of compose himself back into the seat, put the seat back up to the correct position again. And once he is sitting correctly, he looks out and he realizes that it's only about 2000 feet left of the runway. That's about 600 meters. He looks down and he also sees that they haven't reached the speed they're supposed to have. They're nowhere near the V1 and rotate speed. So he continues to accelerate and he says, my controls, so now the rolls are reversed the second time, and he is now pilot flying. When there's about 1,000 feet left of the runway and they're approaching the V1 rotate speed, the captain initiates the rotation. He recognizes that there's more control forces needed than what he's used to, but he continues to rotate more and more and more, and eventually at about 14 degrees nose up, the aircraft gets airborne. When the aircraft gets airborne, both the first officer and the captain recognizes a vibration in the aircraft, something that they liken to wake turbulence. Anyway, they don't think much more of that. The first officer calls out positive rate and he takes the gear up. And about here, the uh, captain increases the thrust back up to 98% again. The crew now proceeds to climb away normally. They're retracting the flaps and proceeding on their way towards Dubai. But at the same time, in the back of the aircraft, the cabin crew, who's sitting in the rear galley, have also noticed during the takeoff roll that the aircraft was suddenly decelerating. And then as the aircraft rotated, they felt a bump. A bump that they said in later investigations they thought maybe was due to the cargo shifting below them. They communicated this to the uh, senior cabin crew as soon as the fasten seatbelt sign was turned off. Meanwhile, in the Trichy air traffic control tower, the controller looks down onto their dashboard and realizes that the localizer part of the ILS for runway 27 suddenly has stopped working. They find this really strange because they know that uh, Air India Express 611 has just departed. So they sent out an investigation crew to uh, have a look at the localizer antenna. The localizer antenna is a setup that is comprised of several uh, individual antennas that's situated on the far end of each runway. You will probably see them if you look out as you're taxiing out for takeoff. They're normally colored red. In a different part of the airport, close to the localized antenna for runway 27, um, a security guard was also working at this time, and he heard a very strange noise as um, Air India Express 611 took off, and he also saw some smoke and dust being thrown up in that general area. As soon as the maintenance crew reaches the threshold from runway 09, that's the opposite end of runway 27, the first thing they see is that one of the threshold lights is missing, and as they continue further away from the threshold, they see that several of the individual antennas that forms part of the localizer were either broken or missing completely. And beyond that, there is a perimeter wall. And to their horror, they realize that there are two gaping holes in this brick wall as well. Now, all of this information is immediately relayed back to Trichy Tower, and Trichy Tower starts to reach out to Air India Express 611. 
At time 0054, so this is five minutes after the departure, um, air traffic control sends the following message to Air India Express 611. While departing, your aircraft passed the end of the runway at a really low altitude. The crew responds that they have checked all their engine instrumentation and their pressurization and that all indications are okay. Two minutes later, air traffic control comes back again and tells the crew that they have received report from a firefighting crew that the perimeter wall is broken at the end of runway 27. The crew responds that all operations are normal, but they are clearly shaken by this message because only a few minutes later they call Trichy Tower back up again and ask, Can you, have you figured out uh, what has happened? Trichy Tower are very quick to respond that. Yes, uh, while you took off, you hit the localizer antenna and the perimeter wall. The localizer is now not working. And to that, the pilot responded, OK, sir, copied, thank you. After this, the flight crew elects to continue to climb initially to flight level 210 at 21,000 feet. And they are doing several um, confidence checks during this climb where they are checking the hydraulic system for leaks, for example. They are checking the engine parameters, which all look normal. And they're also looking at their pressurization system to make sure that they're pressurizing normally. And to all of these checks, they come up with the same thing, that yes, it looks like the aircraft is performing normally. And they're using that information to take the decision to continue to fly towards Dubai. When they reach flight level 210, they uh, contact the next air traffic controller and they ask to maintain flight level 210 for a while so that they can slow the aircraft down and to check if the landing gear system is working correctly. So they do this, they reduce the speed back to a speed where you're allowed to both extend and retract the landing gear. They do so, the landing gear functions normally, and based on that they ask to continue to climb up to flight level 350, which is their final cruising level. Right here we have to take a little bit of a step back to look at the situation. So what we have here is clearly an you know, abnormal takeoff. Um, the crew has not only felt the vibrations of the tail strike themselves, they've also gotten information from air traffic control that, you know, that the localizer antenna and the boundary wall of the airport has been broken. And they have talked to the senior cabin crew, which has relayed the information from the junior cabin crew sitting in the back about them hearing a thud when they departed. So all of this together should paint a really clear picture to the flight crew that they have suffered a tail strike. In our quick reference handbook, which is the emergency manual where all of the emergency checklists are held, there is a tail strike checklist and it is very straightforward. It basically has three points in it. First of all, it gives a condition, a tail strike is suspected. Then it basically tells us that do not pressurize the aircraft because there might be structural damage to the aircraft. It gives the three action items, which is pressurization mode selector to manual, outflow valve hold in the open position until you have depressurized the aircraft, and three, land at the nearest suitable airport. And the reason it says this is if you have actually scraped your tail, if you have had a tail strike, you don't know what kind of damage you have sustained. You don't know if there are weaknesses in the aircraft structure that might get you know, much worse by pressurizing the aircraft. So this is what we're supposed to do. We train for this, we make sure that before we depressurize the aircraft, we're not above flight level 100 because that would then cause a uh, rapid depressurization and a potential emergency descent. And we just nice and calmly set the aircraft up and normally return to the airport that we departed from. That's what we're supposed to do. However, in this case, it seems like the pilots were made confident by their check of their systems and never even considered going into the quick reference handbook to, to check for the tail strike checklist. So the crew continues towards the destination. We don't know exactly what the conversation was in the cockpit during the takeoff and the initial part of the flight because the uh, cockpit voice recorder only records the last two hours of a flight and this flight ends up being over four hours long. But somewhere in the middle of the flight, as the crew is approaching a RNAV point called Totox, we start to get the CVR transcript. And in the CVR transcript, you can see that the pilots are very uneasy about this. They're saying things like, uh, uh, wall, the wall is broken, no? Wall is broken. That's, that's the antenna that must have hit the wall. And they're also saying several times, I hope it doesn't become a news. 
I hope it doesn't become a news. So they're definitely aware that something very bad has happened. And about this time, the company representative of Air India Express have visited the site in Trichy and they've looked at the broken um, localizer antenna and the perimeter wall. And the close to that, they have identified pieces of aircraft skin and honeycomb material. And this representative from the pieces that are left behind can actually say with quite good confidence that yes, these pieces comes from our aircraft. So they're now no doubt that this has happened. The company now calls the pilots up via HF frequency and tell them that they want them to please divert towards Mumbai. The problem here is that the aircraft is now much closer to the destination Dubai than Mumbai and the diversion back towards Mumbai will actually use more track miles. So the pilots have to calculate whether or not they have enough fuel. Initially they think they don't but then they, they look at it and they see that if they get a direct routing towards Mumbai, they can do it. So they accept that direct routing and they start their flight towards Mumbai. As the aircraft is approaching Mumbai, the uh, captain who is still pilot flying starts to configure the aircraft early to make sure that all of the flaps, gear and all of the associated systems are working correctly. He also asks air traffic control to please have the local firefighting equipment and emergency equipment on standby just as a precaution. At time 0508, the aircraft touches down safely in Mumbai. But do you want to know what the engineers found after the aircraft had parked on stand? Well, if you just wait until after this short message from my sponsor, I'll tell you all about it. A special thank you to the sponsor of this episode, which is Skillshare. Now, I know that you are watching this because you are a curious person, a lifelong learner, someone who constantly wants to improve and understand the world around you better. And in that case, Skillshare is definitely something that you should be checking out, okay? They have thousands of high quality video courses and pretty much anything that you can imagine. A course that I'm using myself at the moment is Five Minutes Creativity with Jasmine Cheyenne, where she gives kind of hands-on tips on how to chisel out a few minutes to be creative every single day. And it's something that I personally really need. But there are also courses in, you know, storytelling, creative photography, or even how to use your own home simulator to improve and prepare before you start your private pilot license. So if you think, Peter, that sounds amazing. Well, then the 1000 first of you guys who clicks on this link here below will get one month of premium Skillshare absolutely for free. So click the link and start exploring your curiosity today. As soon as they arrived to stand, it became immediately apparent that the aircraft was severely damaged. Turned out that the tail strike had been so severe that it actually ripped up a big hole just aft of the main wheel well. The first indication of the damage that the engineers could see as it approached stand was that the lower and the collision light had been completely ripped off, probably by the localizer antenna. On top of that, the VHF-2 antenna was gone. Uh, there was some severe damage to the um, aft left horizontal stabilizer, but also to the cowling of the number two engine, the right hand landing gear, one of the tires on the right hand side, but also on the flaps. And there was also several dents just aft of the main hull in the uh, aircraft structure. But what was the chain of events that led up not only to the tail strike, but also to the crew's decision to continue their flight towards Dubai? Well, as the air crash investigation team came to the site in Trichy, they went out to the uh, uh, runway and safety area, the Resa, and they very quickly saw the trail of the main landing gear on the ground in the soft uh, area, but they also found the trail of the aircraft tail as it had impacted during the tail strike and had been dragged through the localizer antenna, um, damaging it severely. The aircraft then seemed to have taken off, but not very high because about a meter up on the one and a half meter high perimeter wall, they found these two holes. And those two holes were at a distance from each other, indicating that this was the main landing gear that had impacted the perimeter wall and knocked those pieces down. Further evidence for that was also the huge amount of wire mesh that they found entangled in the main landing gear when they pulled up on stand in Mumbai that was proven to come from the top part of the perimeter wall. To me, this just speaks to the incredible resilience of the 737-800, you know, <laughs> that it could sustain that kind of abuse and still be able to fly. 
when they looked into the flight data recorder, as I mentioned, they didn't have the cockpit voice recorder. They, uh, they noticed, obviously, what happened at 117 knots. And they started looking into the pilot chair. And what they found was that a uh, part of the recline mechanism had been tightened too much at some point, which meant that instead of the uh, mechanism actually locking for each step, it was partially open. So when a little bit of pressure was put on the backrest, it had a tendency to just collapse backwards, just like if the, uh, the actual mechanism was open. So this is what caught that. But what the investigation showed was that if the first officer would have initiated a rejected takeoff, which he could have done at that point, he would have been able to stop within the remaining runway distance. And also they found that if he would have added thrust, he would have been able to take off normally. They even proved through simulator testing that if the captain, when he took back controls again, if he would have at that point added the thrust back up to 98%, he would have been able to take off within the available runway distance. However, it showed that if he would have tried to reject at that point, the aircraft would have overrun the runway. So the investigation team now understood what had happened on the runway. They kind of understood as well why the first officer hadn't set takeoff trust. He had clearly just missed the fact that the reduction was in there, probably due to the commotion that happened as the seat reclined. But they still didn't understand why the pilots had decided to continue to climb their severely damaged aircraft towards Dubai. Why hadn't they just gone in, done the tail strike checklist and returned back in? They did several interviews with the crew and from those interviews it became apparent that because the crew had gone in and done these checks of their systems, they have gained so much confidence from those checks that they basically didn't think that it was anything wrong with the aircraft. They got too much confidence from checking the system and they used too little of their common sense to, to kind of realize that even though the systems might indicate the aircraft is still functioning, the overwhelming picture of all of the different inputs pointed at a severe tail strike, which should have led them into the tail strike checklist. But this goes to show how easy it is to make faulty decisions when you're under a lot of stress. No matter how much visual oral inputs you get, it is still possible to take these kind of decisions. And once again, it points to the importance of having a set decision-making model. You know how I always talk about PIOSI, you know, problem, information, option, select, execute, and evaluate. Well, if that would have been taken here, if the crew would have taken their time to sit down and look at what kind of information they actually had available to them, what options that actually left to them, this might have had a different outcome. No one was hurt in this incident, everyone was safe, but I still wanted to share this incident with you because it highlights quite a few of the points that I've already made about decision making on the channel. If you wanna see another video where there's really questionable decision making, well then, check out this video up here. Have an absolutely fantastic day. And remember, if there's one acronym that you need to know, it's the acronym CLASS. Bye-bye.